I'm going to do a sermon here on a Christian will not. I'm going to list nine things that a Christian will not do. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been so vexed. You know, I, I hear somebody and, I, and they're like, oh, I'm a Christian. And I go, okay, let's you know, look into this thing. I mean, it'd be nice if people just said I'm a Christian and it was true in every single case. Um, but actually, it's the opposite there. Uh, I'm a Christian. Uh, okay, I need to ask you some questions here. And whatever. And again, you know, we used to go door to door. Uh, years and years ago, and we get that thing all the time. Well, I'm a Christian, and you talk to him a little bit, and you're like, "You're not a Christian. <laughs> you don't. Need, you don't. You know, there's all kinds of things here." But I'm going to go over the nine things, just easy things. I could make this list huge, but these are nine things that a Christian will not do, will not be caught doing or believing or saying. Okay, number one, a Christian will not swear, use profanity, in other words. And I'm going to show you the scriptures on this. Number two, they will not change the name of Jesus. Right? And I, what I'm saying is, for their language, what they are, if they're English speaking, they're going to say Jesus. If they're Hebrew, if they're a Jew, they're going to say Yeshua. Right? If they're Spanish, they're going to say Jesus or whatever it is. I, I guess it, yeah, I think it's Jesus or something. Excuse me, I'm not real good with Spanish, but, you know, whatever their, their, their language is, they're going to say Jesus. Jesus, the equivalent of Jesus, right? Number three, a Christian will not attack the King James Bible. They won't do it. They might not be using the King James Bible because of ignorance or whatever else, but they will not attack the King James Bible. They will not hate the King James Bible. Number four, a Christian will not show off tattoos or piercings or any kind of flesh mutilations. They won't do it. I didn't say Christians will not have tattoos. There are Christians that get saved after getting tattoos on their bodies. But the whole point is, they're not going to be pridefully showing that stuff off and things and showing this here and that thing through. They're not going to be showing that stuff off. That's another dead giveaway that you're dealing with a false convert. Okay, number five, a Christian will not try to get people back under the Torah or to keep the Sabbath day. I have a whole study on the Sabbath day thing and the Seventh-day Adventists, they just get all rabid and everything else and it's just like the Bible is very clear uh, that we don't have to keep the Sabbath today as Christians. Number six, the sixth thing that a Christian will not do, they will not hate Israel. All right, uh, A Christian will look and say, okay, yeah, the Jews are wicked, they've rejected Jesus Christ, that's true, but I'm not going to say that they have no right to that land over there. I'd be, not, uh, they'd be denying Scripture. Number seven, a Christian will not confuse their gender. I'm going to show you the scriptures on it. Number eight, a Christian will not integrate. Number nine, a Christian will not love the devil's music. All right, so we're going to get over, go over these, and I'm going to show you the scriptures, why I say these things. Okay, James chapter three. We're going to look at why the, the scriptures teach that a Christian will not swear. The book of James, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. It says here, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And I believe that. I believe that uh, when you are in ministry, I think that you're going to receive a greater condemnation. So I take my job very seriously. Um, I have been wrong at times, and I have had to come out and correct myself at times. And I will do that. Again, not many others will do that that I've ever seen. They will not come out and say, I was wrong. I was teaching the wrong thing there. This is the correct thing to teach and whatever else. All right? No glory to me or anything. I'm just trying to tell you here. I will receive the greater condemnation. So I'm not going to just tell you and just spout off a bunch of things here and then not have Scripture to back it up. Um, let's continue here. I'm going to receive greater condemnation if I'm wrong. That's why I'm going to back up what I'm saying with Scripture. That's what I was saying. Verse 2, James chapter 3, verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Interesting. So if you want to fight sin, it starts here. Get control of your mouth. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. 
or just a little wheel like that, you can turn a huge, big, you know, boat out there at sea. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame, for it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Is that true? Yeah. You can kill somebody without ever firing a shot. You can make your mouth do it. There's people that have tried to destroy me and my wife and my son and things like this with their talk. Yeah. Call up CPS and things like this and try to get us in trouble with the law or something like that. Say I'm abusing my son and they're not even in the state. They don't even know me personally. You know, thankfully, at least people, some of the people in law enforcement and even CPS have enough sense to say, well, we're not going to go after a guy when somebody from the southern part of, of the United States is calling in complaints about child abuse to somebody that lives in northern Maine. You know, duh. But people can do things with their mouth. Verse 9. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Well, it's okay if a Christian swears and thinks. It's not what the text says. It shouldn't be this way. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can, both, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. If you are saved... You're not going to be using profanity. You say, well, this is to, written, you know, this is James. He's writing to the 12 tribes. James chapter 1, verse 1. That's correct. Let's go to see what Paul has to say. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. It says here, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I think that that would include profanity. Right? 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let, them seek, let him seek peace and ensue it. Refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, what's the book that we're in? Peter. Um, did Peter ever swear? This is an interesting thing I've talked about in other studies. Let's check this out. Matthew chapter 26. This is actually going to be proving what I'm saying from the opposite direction. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26, verse 73. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou, art, thou also art one of them, look at this, for thy speech bereath thee. The way to say it would be, it betrays you. You know, you get around lost people and they're bleep, 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 and you're talking along with them and stuff. All of a sudden they're going to start saying, you're speaking awfully clean. I haven't heard you cuss once. What, are you some kind of Christian or something? You don't laugh at our dirty jokes? You aren't joining in? You aren't, you aren't using this profanity? What's the matter? Thy speech bereath thee. As a Christian, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If Jesus Christ is in your heart, you're not going to be using profanity. I've seen these people, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a true Christian. And a couple sentences later, oh, what the... And they'll use some kind of profanity. 
That's a serious thing. And it's a very quick proof that that person's not saved. And I've seen preachers that will use some, some of the most filthy, foul language that you've ever wanted to hear. It's disgusting. I've had to ban them. <laughs> Crazy. Look at verse 74, Matthew chapter 26, verse 74. Peter, they say, your, your speech is betraying you here, berraying you. And what's Peter do to prove that he's not a saved man? Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. Hey, you sound like you've been with Jesus. You sound like you're one of his disciples. You're not swearing or anything else. And Peter says, oh yeah? How about this? Bleep, 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 bleep. And about that time, they're all standing around going, oh, okay, I guess, I guess you're not saved. I guess you're not one of the guys that's been with Jesus. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, buddy, you can, you know, calm down here a little bit. About that time, the cock crows. Verse 75, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. You know what will happen if you're a Christian and you let a word slip? And by the way, you'll have bad words come into your mind simply because you're hearing it all the time, and that's that the war that goes on in the mind, you know? the imaginations of the thoughts, you know, up here and things like that that you have to, to fight, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, that's going to be there. But if you ever let a word slip out of your mouth, I've seen Christians do it, and it's so funny. New Christians, they'll, they'll, they'll say, oh, what, and, and bleep, and something comes out of their mouth, and they'll go, I've seen that thing countless times, both men and women. They'll let a word slip out, and they go, oh, my God, they'll, they'll quickly get their hand up to the mouth like, oh, and the, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Cussing and swearing for a Christian is immediately going to get you a bad reaction. And let me tell you something. As a Christian, when you hear profanity, it'll vex your soul. There's something about cursing and swearing that is repulsive to a Christian. So you hear somebody and they just flippantly are just using profanity here and there and whatever else, and there's just nothing there where they're going, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, whatever. And I don't mean some guy sitting there going, you know, blah, 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 excuse my French, but you know what I mean, the blah, blah, you know. Not going to happen as a Christian. You say, why? What's the, what's the big deal? What's the big deal if we swear a little bit? Well, go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 through 37. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Yeah, you get some guy that's cussing. It's because his heart is dirty and filthy and wicked. If he has no conscience about it and he can just and just use profanity, you know, his heart is black. He's not redeemed. He's not saved. Verse 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Yeah. That's why a Christian doesn't use profanity. That's why a Christian does not let corrupt communication come out of their mouth. I didn't say you don't, you know, you messed up and you hit your thumb with a hammer and, and bleep, and it comes out and you, oh I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to say that. I didn't say that. I said just using it just like, eh, and there's no conviction. It's not going to happen for a saved Christian. So if you're out there someplace, out there in the world, or you're looking at a video or something, somebody that's a Christian, they're giving a testimony or whatever, and you hear them just bloop, just use profanity, and you go, like that that ugh, that repulsion, and they don't say anything about, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know why that slipped out of my mouth. You're dealing with a saved, or excuse me, you're dealing with a lost person. I was going to say you're not dealing with a saved person. You're dealing with somebody that's lost. Very easy test. If they're using all kinds of profanity and things and there's no 
cover up Ford or whatever else, uh, you're dealing with somebody that's lost. Plain and simple. Number two, a Christian will not change the name of Jesus. Go to Acts chapter 4. There are many things that a Christian will do, but one that's genuinely saved will not do these things. A Christian will not change Jesus' name. Acts chapter 4 verse 10 be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved." Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and, un and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Oh, well, the name Jesus is just a recent invention blah, 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 and stuff like this. Well, it sure has had some power over the last few hundred years. Sure has changed the world over the last few hundred years. Do you think if Jesus is a false name for the Savior of the world, for God manifest in the flesh. Do you think if Jesus is a false name, do you think it would have done anything? Any kind of power? Of course not. God wouldn't have blessed it. You see, the name in English, from our English King James Bible, our perfect King James Bible, the name is Jesus. And you get these weirdos coming along and they say, it should be, my favorite one, they'll go, they'll say, it's Yahushua. You say Jesus, that's a pagan name. It's Yahushua. Like there's some kind of brilliant scholar. Uh, Yahashua in Hebrew means Joshua. Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Okay? There's a difference there. And, then, and of course, my all-time favorite though, my newest favorite, is Yahawashi. I see this now. Yahawashi. I'm going, what is that? And my wife and I, we were talking about this, trying to figure out Yahawashi means, and we came up with it. It's a hybrid Yamaha and Kawasaki together. Yahawashi, you see? Makes sense. <laughs> Weird. I'm not going to go after a Jew that comes along and says, uh, Ye Yeshua is my Messiah. I believe in Yeshua. If I go over to Israel or something, which is never going to happen, but, you know, until the Millennial Kingdom, then I'll be there. But, you know, I'm over in, in the streets of Jerusalem and I see some Jew there and he's standing up and he's saying, Yeshua, and stuff. And I hear him saying, Yeshua, and he's speaking in Hebrew and I don't get the rest of what he's saying. I'm not going to go, you lying devil, you, his name's Jesus. Well, no, I'm not going to say that. He's saying Jesus in his language. But all these people come along, English speaking people come along and tell me I shouldn't be saying Jesus. I don't think so. That's not the Holy Spirit of God that's in you. All right. If you're a Jew, say Yeshua. If you speak Hebrew, say Yeshua. If you're German, say Jesus in your language. If you're Spanish, say Jesus in your language. Or if you're whatever, say Jesus the way your language translates that word. But if you're English speaking, don't come to me and tell me I shouldn't be saying Jesus. That's nonsense. Philippians chapter 2. There's this whole Hebrew roots cult that has been created and all these people and they just try to get you away from the plain teachings of the King James Bible and they come out and they're saying it's Yeshua or Yahushua or Yahawashi 750 or something like that. Whatever. You know, it's nonsense. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. What's the name above every name? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
You say, but you see the original, the original. Okay, then use the original, all right? You're so smart and everything else. Oh, the original wouldn't have said Jesus, okay? Uh, it, it didn't say Jesus. Okay, then here you go. Here's a copy of the original, all right? Here's your Textus Receptus, all right? The original. Now you go on out there and you do your, all your Bible studies and you read this, okay? Do that. Don't be a hypocrite and use a King James Bible when you have that. See, you call the King James Bible God's Word, but then correct it with Greek or Hebrew. If it's God's book, don't correct it. And you say, well, it's not God's book. A translation can't be inspired. Then there you go. There you go. Write gospel tracts, go on out and give them out there in the, in the Greek and the Hebrew, you know, and stuff. Greek for the New Testament, Hebrew for the Old Testament. Go on out and do it. Don't waste your time with this English Bible. If it's got a false name of Jesus and stuff, it should be Yeshua and all this other stuff, then don't use it. Simple. It's really simple. Number three, a true Christian will not attack the King James Bible. 1 John chapter 5. This is circular reasoning. You're using the Bible to prove the Bible. That's one of my favorite things. Okay, uh, what other source should I use to prove the validity of this book? If this book is God's book, I can read from it and say, you know what, that is true and this is how it works out there in the world. Thus proving this is God's book. If this book prophesies future events and I can prove that they're happening according to what's going on in this book, then it proves that its origin is supernatural. Brilliant people we have out there. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 through 13. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. The record. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this, this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Can we agree with that so far? Okay. You say, I believe in Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. Okay, who's Jesus? Well, he's the Son of God. How do you know that? Well, he died on the cross to pay for my sins. How do you know? Well, the Bible says so. The what? The Bible? You mean a book that you're holding in your hands that you don't believe is perfect? Oh, you can trust the parts where it talks about Jesus dying on the cross and how you can get saved and go to heaven when you die. But the rest of it, there's other parts that you can't. You can and you maybe and you... You see the hypocrisy? I mean, if this book is wrong in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, that shouldn't be in there. The Johann Johannine comma, as it's called by the scholars, uh, that shouldn't be in there. Well, then what makes you think that John 3.16 should be in there? Hmm? Well, because, see, it lines up with the Greek text over here. It lines up with his, how do you know that that's right? 28 editions of the Nestles. Multiple editions of the Textus Receptus. How do you know they're perfect? And then the, the, the real fun one, the new version people, they'll say, well, the original autographs. The originals say, the original this, the original. They've never seen the original autographs. I'm going to tell you something that's even worse than that. Nobody has seen the original autographs in one volume. No one. Except for the Lord. And he doesn't think too highly of the originals and stuff. You know, He writes the Ten Commandments and Moses takes the Ten Commandments, the originals, and he throws them down the ground and smashes them. And God doesn't go zap dead to Moses and resurrect the, the stones, come back together and reforge. No, it's just like, oh, we'll write that again. But you're supposed to venerate these original autographs. There are no original autographs in one volume. There is no Bible out there that has all the original autographs. You need to understand that. But look at verse 13. You say, well, the record, it's a, it's a spiritual feeling. It's a, it's a thing, the burning in the bosom, if you're a Mormon or whatever. you know, It's a spiritual thing. No, it isn't. Look at this, verse 13. 
These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you know you have eternal life? I do. Why? I can prove it according to the pages of Scripture. What's your proof? You say, well, my Bible, which I prefer, is it perfect? Well, no translations inspired. Then you're not saved. Why? You have to have a perfect written record. Do you have a perfect written record? Perfect written record? <laughs> Do you have it? You see the problem you get yourself into with all these new versions? You say, well, the King James Bible, that there, there has been different editions, you know. And they've changed, you know, from the 1611 to the 1769. And, and I can prove to you that the translators wrote things about, you know, that every translation should be corrected and things, and, and translators to the reader. And, and I can prove this and I can prove that. And actually, uh, you know, the Jehannine come on and the, the last 12 verses of the book of Mark. And, and, and blah, 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 blah. okay, then is, it's not perfect. Do you call this book God's word? See, when you get right down to it, all the talk, all the scholarly talk about minuscule, majuscule, cursives, uncials, this fragment, papyrus fragment, and this Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and the codices, and the, and the, the, the witnesses, and the blah, 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 all that stuff comes down to one very, very basic thing that the scholars don't want you to think about. Can you hold God's perfect word in your hands? Because if you can't, if there is no perfect book out there, Who's to say who's lost and who's saved? That's the issue. And understand, again, if you're new to this whole thing, you can watch some of my videos on the Bible version issue, the real Bible version, real Bible version issue exposed, my secondary channel, or it's on this channel in multiple parts. There are two basic different types of Bibles. Okay? There's the Syrian type, the King James Bible, with the Textus Receptus. And then there's the Alexandrian, the Egyptian type, which is the type used by the Catholic Church, the Nestle's Greek text, the NIV, the ESV, New King James Version blends the two. They'll blend some of the Receptus readings with Nestle's readings. So that's what's going on here. But again, the Holy Spirit of God is not going to make a Christian hate the King James Bible. Never going to happen. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 through 25. People, you know, I've gotten people and they'll go, you're worshiping a book. We're not saved by a book. We're saved by Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit and things like this. Really? A little ignorant of the Scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but, by, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth, forever lowercase w it's talking about the written word for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away but the word of the lord endureth forever and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you are you saved can you prove to me that you are saved can you hold god's word in your hands you get somebody coming along and stuff and they start to attack the King James Bible, they start to say, well, you know, the King James Bible is a good translation. And I do use it somewhat. But, look out for the old Billy Goat uh, statement there. It's good, but. Mm -hmm. Be careful of that. Um, but you see that kind of a thing, you're dealing with somebody that's lost. Some website coming out and attacking the King James Bible and here's an error, here's an error, here's an error, here's an error. Ask them what the perfect standard is then. They'll point you to the original autographs or something like that that doesn't exist. You're not dealing with a saved person. Number four. A Christian will not show off tattoos or piercings. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 16 through 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 
If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You don't have a right to do whatever you want with your body. You're to keep your body in good shape. And coming along and putting marks on it and piercing it and cutting it and all kinds of stuff like that. Cuttings in your flesh. Uh, the Bible talks about a man possessed with you know, legion, many devils. And he's there in the tombs always crying and cutting himself. What is a tattoo? You're cutting yourself. A little needle gets in there. It's cutting your flesh. And then it puts ink into that cut. Real healthy, you know. I mean, there have been plenty of studies to show how toxic, you know, the ink is and things with the tattooing, and you're putting that thing in your flesh. Not a good idea. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And you can get into the whole thing, this, this you know, argument over the tattoo thing and whatever else. But the whole point is, you don't have a right to just do whatever you want with your body. This body belongs to God if you're saved. Again, a saved Christian will know that. Now, they might have the scars and the marks of the old life. There might be some tattoos on there from the old life. Okay, fine. But you don't get saved. The Holy Spirit of God is not going to be in somebody. And that person goes, I think I want to get a tattoo. And the Holy Spirit goes, oh, cool. Yeah, man, cool. No. And I mean, what is coming in the future? The mark of the beast. Part of it, according to Revelation chapter 20, is these people are receiving a mark upon their forehead. Revelation 13 says in the forehead, in the right hand. But Revelation chapter 20 says it's upon the forehead. So I think it's a combination of a couple different things. The Lord doesn't want you being marked upon your forehead. Number five, a Christian will not try to get people back under the Torah, they'll say the Torah, or keep the Sabbath day. I'm going to show you that. Galatians chapter 2. This disturbs me so much. I see these people and they're just, you know, oh, they're some kind of new Christian. And I was, I, was, I was another type of Christian before, just your traditional type of Christian. Now God showed me so much. And they're going over all this stuff. they got a filthy mouth, tattooed up. And then they'll go, I believe that we're to worship, you know, celebrate the Torah. You get these guys and they got these like ginormous big beards, you know, and, and they'll say Yeshua and all this stuff. And let's go back to the Torah. Let's keep his Torah and all this stuff. And, the, and they try to like, act like they're Jewish or something. And I'm like going, yeah, shut your mouth. This is stupid. Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. And praise the Lord if you're a Jew and you're saved. If you're a real Hebrew, you know, thank the Lord for you. But these people that try to fake that they're Jews, Bible in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, and Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, calls them the synagogue of Satan. They that, are, they, they that say they are Jews and are not. They're the synagogue of Satan. You've got to watch out for that. Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. You're not supposed to have any tolerance at all for these people. You get into my comment section, you know, I can't come after you or whatever else. I mean, if you were coming, if anybody ever tried to come here, you know, and tried to, you know, join me or, you know, whatever else, and I start hearing the Torah stuff, out you go. Nope, sorry. Out you go. You know, even a Jew, right? You don't have to be under the Torah and all this other stuff, you know. And Paul, as a Jew, is rebuking Peter in this passage saying, you know, you're not supposed to be getting the Gentiles back under the law. So, zero tolerance. And I'm going to have zero tolerance in the comments. When you start doing your Yeshua stuff and all this other thing, I'm going to delete comments. I'm going to kick people off the channel. Galatians 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, 
and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, I'm going to kick something in a future study. I'm doing the, the notes for it and things like that. I'm preparing to do the notes, I should say. I've been writing down some scriptures and getting the arguments together in my head on this thing of legalism. I've seen this thing. I've been called legalistic for years and years and years by modern professing Christians. You're being legalistic. You're, you know, whatever. And I'll say, what do you mean? Well, you're trying to get people back under the law. You know, I say there's a changed life after salvation. People say, you're trying to get people under the law. They don't understand the scriptures. Um, when have I ever told people to go back under the Levitical law? When have I ever told people that you need to go back to the Torah and study the first five books of Moses and you need to live by that? I've never said that to anyone. I'm not trying to get people back under the law. All right? I'm trying to show you New Testament doctrine for a Bible-believing Christian that says there's supposed to be a change in your life. There's supposed to be fighting against sin. There's a war between the flesh and the spirit. That's what I'm talking about. There are commands and rules in the New Testament for a Christian right now. And I tell people about that and they go, you're trying to put us back under the law. And I'm going, what? How am I trying to put people back under the law? This is insanity. Well, this is legalism. You're being legalistic. Well, uh, show me that word in the King James Bible. Then maybe we'll talk, okay? It's not in the King James Bible. So people invent these little terms and stuff like this, and it's legalistic, and you, you these rules. If it's in the Pauline epistles, then you're supposed to follow it. Yes, there's supposed to be a changed life. Yes, there are rules and standards that the Lord put upon Christians to keep. This is not condemning, you know, a Christian saying, hey, you need to be following that rule over there. You're not disobeying that and whatever else. Galatians, the book of Galatians is not about that. All right. It's about Jews coming along and trying to get Gentiles back under the Torah, back under the, the first five books of Moses, the law. Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21 for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. All right? I'm not trying to frustrate the grace of God. All right? I'm not trying to tell people you need to go back under the Old Testament law. I've never said that. And I get so sick and tired of these people saying, you teach lordship salvation, lordship salvation, you're trying to get people under the law and things like this, you're legalistic. No, I'm not. I mean, show me one place in any of my sermons where I've ever told people you need to go back under the Torah or something like this. I've never said that. Again, people lie about me, just it's incredible the amount of lies that are out there. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law when he died on the cross. Galatians 5 verse 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Okay? And the Bible talks about turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Again, that's what a lot of these people are doing. They, they, they're trying to do this. They do this little trick where you come in and you say, you know what, um, the Bible says you shouldn't be doing that. Hey, that guy over there is not working. Well, the Bible says neither should he. They say, oh, you're being legalistic. You say, what, what's legalistic? It's condemned in the book of Galatians. They're trying to get people back under the law not away, and, and away from grace. And you go, wait a second here. Uh, that's not what the Bible's teaching. That was a command given to a Christian in the New Testament. I'm not trying to get people back under the Old Testament law. You see? See how these people do this? They play this little head game with you and you go, oh, well, I'm not trying to get people into works or anything. I'll mess with your head. But look at the verse there. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Is Christ of no effect to this ministry? Do I not preach Jesus Christ? See? 
and all these people that could try to take you back to the Torah and everything else, they're getting you away from Jesus Christ. That's what they're doing. I don't do that. <laughs> right? I know some people, it's still not going to get through to them. You know, can't help them. What about this thing of the Sabbath day? Turn to Romans chapter 13. That's another thing that they'll do. You know, some some dude and he's got, you know, beard, beard that's four foot long and he's stroking it and he's saying, and, uh, you know, Christian Christianity, pagan Christians, they worship God on the Sunday, the sol solar Sunday of Baal. You know, I worship, you know, Yahawashi on, uh, you know, certain motocross weekends. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I, I worship, uh, you, you know, Yahweh or whatever else on his holy day, the Sabbath day. Well, then you're doing something that Paul didn't do. Romans chapter 13, verse 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly keeping the Sabbath day. Oh, no, wait. No. Remembering the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh, it doesn't say that. Um, if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Wait a second. No, this can't be right. I should probably go with another Bible or something like this. Uh, it doesn't say anything about remembering the Sabbath day there. Hmm. Why would a Jew like Paul leave out remembering the Sabbath day if the Sabbath day is that important? Let me show you why. Romans chapter 14 Romans chapter 14, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another, man, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. One of the areas that a Christian can agree to disagree. If you want to worship on Sabbath day, go right ahead. No problem. You're not commanded to. But if you're Jewish and you've done that and it's a custom and things like that, go ahead. Sure, absolutely. But if I decide I'm going to worship the Lord on Tuesday, um, don't come down on me because I'm not doing it on the Sabbath day. And if some other Christian says I want to do it Sunday morning, don't come down on them. You see? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Here's a thought. Um, how about worshiping the Lord seven days a week? A lot of the early Christian groups did that. The Waldenses would do that. They'd have church services morning and evening every day. Hmm. Number six, a Christian will not hate Israel. Turn to Romans chapter 11. You meet somebody and they're, uh, I'm a Christian. And then they start to rail on the nation of Israel and they start to get all mad and froth at the mouth. I can't stand it. The Jews are just behind everything. They just ruined everything. You're not dealing with a Christian. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You know, when you look at the nation of Israel and you say, those people are all wicked, Christ-rejecting, just Jewish, just Zionist, you know, um, you're speaking about a whole nation there, condemning every single person because you can point out a few examples of people that are wicked. And Elijah, Elias here, he's doing the same thing. He's, he's going, you know, Lord, you know, against Israel, and I'm the only one that's left alone. And the Lord says to him there, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men. Hmm. I wonder how many Jews are right now over there in Israel that are waiting to receive Jesus as their Messiah. 
when the time of Jacob's trouble starts. My Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, there's actually going to be 144,000 sealed Jews in that time of Jacob's trouble. Moses and Elijah are over there going to be walking around the streets proclaiming the gospel. Hmm. And you're going to turn on the nation of Israel? You call yourself a Christian, and yet you say the people over there don't have a right to be in that land? Well, they're not real Jews. Well, that's a problem because God said He's going to bring them back to their land in unbelief. You see? You see, once you learn these little basic things here that I'm going over in this sermon here, you'll be able to spot the false brethren very quickly. You hear them in there, I'm a Christian, and bleep, 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 and you go, whoop, hold, hold on, sorry, nope, you're not saved. Holy Spirit of God's not going to let you say that type of stuff. Um, you hear some, uh, you see some Christian, they're walking around, they got muscle shirt, you know, and stuff like this, and they got, look at my tattoos, and here's a coiled serpent, and here's, you know, flames coming up over my forearm and stuff like this. Walking around, you know, showing it off and stuff. You're not dealing with a Christian. All these other things, you're not dealing with a Christian. False convert. Look at verse 13, Romans chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. Shouldn't that be our desire to see some Jews get saved? Verse 15, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root, root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Okay? Just stop right there. Israel is likened to a fig tree, essentially, uh, and also an olive tree and things. There's different typologies in the Bible. And he's saying there that there's Jews. They have that covenant of promise that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, going down through. They have that heritage, that godly ancestry, but through unbelief, they get broken off. We are born into a, with a spirit of adoption. We have not replaced the nation of Israel. I mean, how does that even make sense? You know, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. I also am an Israelite and things. Is Paul talking about the church? Has God cast away the church? God forbid. I'm also of the church. You see? It doesn't make any sense. What's going on here is they're part of that natural tree and if they're if they, you know, through unbelief, God breaks them off. A Jew that rejects Jesus Christ and dies that way, dies in their sins, and they go to hell. Children on the promise and the whole thing. Snap, breaks them off into hell. Verse 20. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear were to fear something? What is it? For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Huh? God spared not the natural branches? He broke them off? They went to hell? Why would Paul write to a Christian and say, take heed lest he also uh, spare not thee? Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. The Jews that unbelief, you know, severity, snaps them off, into hell you go. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now there's a debate there, and a lot of people just go, well, you know, let's not talk about this and whatever else. And I've always tried to be honest, and I say, I look at that thing and I go, okay, there's different ways to look at this thing. And you can say, the thing of being cut off means your nation is cut off, he's writing to the Romans, he's writing to the Gentiles and things like this. He's the apostle of the Gentiles. We read about that in verse uh, 11. There, um, 
No, actually verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles. So he's speaking to Gentiles as a group. But uh, usually when he says, when the Bible says thee or thou, it's a singular reference to people, to, to a person. Okay. Now, again, I know that there's a debate there. But my whole point is, if this is a, a direct warning saying you as a Christian, if you start to go against the nation of Israel, God can break you off like he did to the unbelieving Jews and you get cast into hellfire. There's that possibility. Or you can just say it's a your nation is broken off and, you know, as a Gentile, you get broken off from the promises and things like that, the, the root and the fatness of the tree, and your nation is snapped off and cut off. It's still a bad thing, you know, and I'm honest with that debate and I'm going to tell you both sides of it and say, I don't know. I believe in eternal security. I've preached on eternal security. I'm fully convinced of eternal security. But I look at this and I say, um, be not high-minded, but fear. Does it mean national cutting off or Gentile nations being cut off or something from the blessings of God that come and things? Is it individual, you know, thou, thee, broken off? Thou standest by faith? Is that a nation, a Gentile nation? A Gentile nation, thou standest by faith? But one thing we can come to the conclusion on here is, either way, it's a really bad thing to mess with the Jews. Either way, it's a really bad thing to go against the nation of Israel. And look over there and you see Donald Trump comes out and, and you know, again, you got to remember Romans chapter 13. The powers that be are ordained of God. God put him in there. Does that mean God's for him? No, it doesn't mean God's for him. Uh, God put Nebuchadnezzar into power. He called him my servant Nebuchadnezzar back in the Old Testament. Well, then God was for everything he did. No, no, not at all. God will put men and stuff like that, kings and, and presidents and rulers and things into countries. Now, whatever you want to say about Donald Trump, he's a Jesuit, he's a very wicked man, Jesuit trained, very wicked man. But God had him do that thing of saying, hey, Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel. That's what the Bible says. And when I see professing Christians going against that and saying, that's ridiculous, Zionism and stuff like this, you're not dealing with real Christians. You're dealing with fakes, with frauds. I mean, Donald Trump did not come out and say that Jerusalem is the holy city of God that is blessed of God and they're saved and they're going to heaven when they die. And that's why they should be given, you know, Israel should be given the city of Jerusalem and because they're just such holy, righteous people. He didn't say that. He said Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. No Christian is going to argue with that. You're going to read the Bible and say, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, absolutely. Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, is the capital city of Israel. And a quick little test is, you say that to somebody and they, and they start frothing at the mouth about Zionist conspiracies, you're dealing with a lost person. A lost devil-possessed person. It's that simple. Number seven, a Christian will not confuse their gender. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 through 15. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Do you ever go to a store and you see something like this? And you see something from behind and all of a sudden it turns around and it's something other than what you thought? I remember back when long hair was very popular back in the 1980s and 1990s when satanic music was becoming very, very popularized and everything. Now it's just so accepted, you know church buildings are, are performing it and things. More on that in just a little bit. And, uh, but I remember there were so many times to go to the store and I'd, you know, I'd look and I'd see this woman, you know, long, beautiful hair, and all of a sudden that woman turns around and you go, blah, blah, you know, and it's, it's a guy. And you're going, yikes, you know. There's a bluegrass song uh, Lester Flatt sang called uh, I Can't Tell the, the, 
can't tell the boys from the girls or something like that. And brother, it's really messing up my world. Talking about being a country guy and he comes into the city and it's like he's going, is that a guy or a girl? I don't know, you know. And I, by the same token, I've seen sometimes you see a, some woman and from behind and you, you know, short hair about my length, you know, and stuff like this and a couple inches above the collar of the shirt and it turns around and you go, whoa, you know, it's a, it's a woman. What in the world? It's an abomination. It's not supposed to be that way. You say, well, I'm a guy and I have long hair and things. Okay, well, then God says it's a shame unto you. Well, I'm a woman and I like to keep my hair really short. It's easier to manage and things. Well, then uh, there's no glory coming from your hair. Excuse me. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. There's supposed to be distinction. God is a God of distinction. He likes different things, you see. God didn't just say, um, I'm going to create trees out there. Uh, pine trees. There, that's good enough. Pine trees, all different species of red pine, white pine, uh, loblolly pine, uh, longleaf pine, this kind of pine. is Multiple species of pine. And, and then how about the fir trees? And, and then hemlock and then, uh, you know, and then you get into the hardwoods, you get into oak and, and you know, poplars and, and maples and walnut. And, and then you get into the far and, you know, trees, ebony and coca bola and, and, you know. God loves distinction. God created men and women to look differently. A Christian will not confuse their gender. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You get saved, you can change, you see. Such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. You're saved, and then there's a change that happens. You are sanctified. Ye are, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There is a change that happens when you get saved. You're going to want to please God in all areas of your life. But what does it condemn up there? Effeminate. What is effeminate? Do you think God calls a woman effeminate? A woman is supposed to be feminine. Why would God condemn a woman? Hey, you're being too much like a woman. Uh, no, God is condemning a man acting like a woman. A man acting like a sissy. I mean, even the, you know, it's not even just the, the action of sodomy of, you know, man and man together or woman and woman together or whatever. It's not even just that. It's the fact that God looks at two men and he goes, you're acting like a bunch of effeminate women. And isn't it interesting that you have sodomite relationships? One's going to be the man, one's going to be the woman. They can't get away from it. I see these sodomites and stuff. I've seen a few couples in my life. I, don't, I stay away from the cities. I avoid them like a plague. But I see these sodomite couples occasionally. One of them's asking, acting more masculine than the other one. One of them is effeminate. One is masculine. And you see these men and stuff like this, and they act like they're a sissy or something like that. I don't even, I don't even want to act like one. Why? You're not supposed to. Effeminate. But uh, it's okay if you wear gender-neutral clothing. No, it isn't. I want to look like a man. I want to sound like a man. I'm going to act like a man. And you should too. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. 
I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Hmm. Modest apparel. You know, for thousands of years, women wore dresses and skirts. And that was because no one went back in time to that time period to enlighten these women, women that were making their own dresses and their own clothing. Nobody went back in time and showed them that pants were the way to go. I mean, all those years, thousands of years, women were just so stupid, they didn't know how to make pants for themselves. And now we have female pants out there and stuff like this, and what a wonderful thing. Put pants on, cut your hair short like a man, and just walk around saying God's cool with what I'm doing. I don't think so. Why is it that just here in the end times, women have all of a sudden started to wear pants? Why? I mean, that was the argument that, that really convinced me. I was going all this Baptist stuff and everything. I was in this Baptist church stuff, and, and I had a brother, you know, I talked about in the testimony, and I've talked about in other videos too. And we were back and forth, and I was, I was trying to defend the thing of women wearing pants, and he was just like, brother, why did it all of a sudden just show up right now in the end times when there's a falling away? And I thought, yeah, that, that doesn't work. If it's good and acceptable and fine and everything else, it would, it would have been done for thousands of years. But women's liberation brought the whole thing in. We want the right to vote. We want the right to run for political office. We want, to, we want to be in the military. We want to this. We want to that. We want to work outside the home. We want to do all these other things. And you know, women don't say, I'm going to fight for this. I want to fight for being out there, losing my mind in, a, in, a, in, in, in the workforce and being stressed out and everything. And, and we're going to fight for these things. Why? <laughs> you know, it's a blessed thing for a woman to be able to be a keeper at home. But let's just bring in the gender confusion. Let's just have the whole system out there in the world where you go and you go to the store and half the time you can't tell who's who. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a couple walking and from behind I don't know which is the man and which one's the woman. I mean, they're wearing the same clothes, the, you know, maybe not the same exact identical outfit, but the same basic look and I'm going, what is the man? What's the woman? You know? What is it? It's an abomination. You think God's, you know, happy with this thing? It's disgusting. And how about the thing of shamefacedness and sobriety? Shamefacedness means bashful. Sobriety means calm and serious. I mean, I praise the Lord for my wife because her past and everything else, you know, the women's, oh, well, she's so this and she's so that. What about her past? She was a soldier, military veteran. She had a, a mouth like a sailor. She's told me stories and things, of, you know, how she used to cuss people out and things like that. And, and, you know, and she just, she got saved. She heard the sermon that I did on, on the thing of modest apparel. She looked at the scriptures for herself and she went, boom, and she changed. Now we go out in, in, in town and stuff like this. She practices shamefacedness and sobriety. We'll be at a store sometimes and I'm over here looking at something and an employee of the store walks up to my wife and they say, can I help you find something? And she'll say, I don't know. You'd have to ask my husband. Or can I help you with that or something like that? And she'll say, let me ask my husband. And she's not going around like some social butterfly, just and talking like this, ha ha, and so making a big, you know, life of the party or something. No, shamefacedness and sobriety. And she wasn't that way. And don't tell me, well, it's because I'm abusing her, or mentally putting her down. Or she's doing it because that's what happens when you get saved. The Holy Spirit of God comes into a woman like that and changes her major drastic changes number eight a christian will not integrate oh no 
he isn't going to say this, is he? Well, let's look at the scriptures and see what the scriptures has to say. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Through 18. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate. Segregate yourself, in other words. Saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You say, wait a second. It doesn't say anything about interracial marriage. I didn't say it did. Why are you thinking it? Integrate isn't just about interracial marriages and stuff like that. That's not even what I'm trying to talk about here. I'm talking about integrating, you know, let's have interfaith dialogue. You see? That's what I'm talking about. Integration is wicked. And I do believe the interracial marriage thing is wicked too. That's why we had anti-miscegenation laws here. But that's not the main point that I'm trying to get to. Integration, where you have interfaith dialogue and Christians and Chrislam and all this other stuff, let's come together and let's, let's just kind of get together and I'm going to go over here. And I don't particularly agree with all the doctrines that they preach at this church, but I'm just going to go anyhow. That's an abomination. And when you have somebody who is not segregated, who does not believe in separating themselves from the world, and they say, I'm a Christian, but I think that there are Catholics that are saved. And I, I, I really, I, I've gone to Methodist churches. I feel at home there. I go to Baptists. I go to there. I get it. Uh-huh. You're dealing with somebody that's lost. A Christian will not integrate. Period. And by the way, going back to the uh, racial thing. How is the whole world going to come together to form the Antichrist kingdom? Integration or segregation? All the nations getting together or all the nations staying separate? Let's break down the walls. Break them down. Sure. See where that's gotten us here in America. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 28 through 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. See? See, we're supposed to come together. We're supposed to integrate. Um, that's not what it's saying. Spiritually, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. But then people say, see, there's no difference between a physical Jew and a physical Gentile. Really? Well, then apparently there's no, there's neither male nor female. We're all asexual or something like this. Neither male nor female. Hermaphrodite or something like this. That's, well, that's both. But I'm saying, you see, it's weird. We're all one in Christ Jesus. God is no respecter of persons. That's very true. But you know what? There's different roles there. God wants distinction. That's why he says to Peter, hey, you're the apostle to the Jews. Go on over there to the circumcision. Paul, you go to the Gentiles, to the uncircumcision. You're going to have different challenges with both. Peter didn't get over there and look and, and walk in and say, hey, guys, you know, to the Jews, hey, I, I, you guys got, you know, you're having a hog roast today. No, but Paul might have. Paul walk in there and he smells... Smells like some kind of pork product or something. Traveling around and stuff like this on his missionary travels, he's not going out to the Jews. They're there sometimes and whatever, but he's going to the Gentiles. There is a dis difference there. There is supposed to be distinction. And you don't go to the Jews and say, hey, you need to give up all your ways and all your culture and everything else, and you need to come here over here because you're a Christian now, and you got to start acting like, 
Americans or whatever else. No, you don't do that. And you don't go to the male and say, you got to start acting more like a female or go to the female and say, you got to start looking and acting like a man. You see, God wants distinction. He wants separation. I'm not going to go hang out with a bunch of Muslims or with a bunch of Mormons or a bunch of Roman Catholics or whatever. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to separate myself. I am not going to integrate myself into society. I am separate from them. But you see somebody and they say, well, we just believe that God's love is there. And, and then each of us has our own faith traditions. And we're going to just, you know, we're not going to argue. We're not going to fight. We don't want division. We want unity. You're dealing with a lost person. You are not dealing with a Christian. A Christian will not integrate. And finally, number nine, a Christian will not love the devil's music. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I did a study, um, I think it's called The Devil's Music, and that thing has been taken down from so many different things and whatever else because I included music samples in it. You have to to be able to prove what I'm trying to say with an overemphasis on there's music has three parts to it okay essentially I'm not some professional musician so don't get rough on me here if I don't have it exactly perfect here it has harmony it has melody it has rhythm you need all three parts of uh, or all three things in music to make it good to make it make you know any kind of sense at all um, now if you have a primary emphasis on rhythm then it's going to have a lot of beat. It's going to be very, very heavy and things like, you know, heavy metal, rap, whatever else. Uh, that leads to the flesh, the exaltation of the flesh. You go to a strip club, obviously I'm not saying that, to do that, but you go to some place like that or a nightclub or whatever else, they're going to have a heavy beat. They're trying to appeal to the flesh, right? But if you go to a symphony orchestra or something like that, there's going to be beautiful harmony, Harmony and melody, it's going to be melodious music. It's going to have a very beautiful, you know, kind of a waltz to it or whatever. There's waltzes, there's other types of things. Again, I'm no expert on music, but my point is there will be a rhythm to the music, but it's not going to overpower harmony and melody, right? And I, like I said, I did a whole study on it, and I, I can't put it on my channel because it keeps getting flagged for copyright stuff and whatever. It's an audio sermon. It's a couple hour long audio sermon. And I went over a lot of the science behind all this stuff. But a Christian is not going to love the devil's music. The devil's music is something that has primary emphasis on the fleshly rhythm uh, of you know, the beats and the, the hard driving sounds of, of drums and guitars and whatever else. That's very, very heavy rhythm. All right? It's going to lead to aggression. And a lot of us that had a heavy metal background, uh, like myself, I used to like to listen to a lot of heavy metal. I went to heavy metal concerts for graduation. I went to uh, Jackal and was the opening band, and then Aerosmith was the, the final band or whatever you call it, you know, the big act or whatever, Hershey Park Arena. That would have been in 1994, summer of 1994. Went with a good friend of mine. And uh, so I've been to rock concerts, big ones. I've been to heavy metal and, and all the other stuff. And it is an extremely wicked atmosphere. Extremely wicked. Why? Because of a primary emphasis on rhythm. That is the devil's music. You cannot take that and serve God with that. You cannot please God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God with fleshly things. Fleshly performances. You can't please God with a strip show or something like that. Or some woman up there dancing around naked or something. You can't do that. Right? And you can't please God with some kind of fleshly music. That's as simple as that. And what will happen is when you get saved, you're going to go to the store sometime and you're going to hear some kind of music from your past and your flesh is going to want to be going, eh, you know, it's going to be, your flesh is going to be singing along and, and it's going to stick in your brain. And you know that. You know I'm telling you the truth. But as a Christian, it doesn't bother me. I don't, I'm not bothered by that. I like to listen, still listen to my rock music and stuff. I've known Christians, they get, quote-unquote, saved, 
and they don't have any qualms at all about keeping all their rock music CDs or whatever else. They just, yeah, I still listen to it. I appreciate it. That's a problem. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. <clears throat> Excuse me, righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Isn't it interesting that most of the uh, rock and roll and things like that, so many of them, they've killed themselves. Different guys, you know, Kurt Cobain, we used to call him Cobain of Nirvana, the rock band Nirvana, blow his brains out. These guys do it all the time. They overdose on drugs or blow their brains out or whatever else. Do it all the time. The end of those things is death. Verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah, things change when you get saved. And one of the big ones is you'll go from loving that music to hating that music. You'll go to a store and you'll hear the music playing and it's just like you just want to run out of there just like that. There's a store down in Holton here in Maine, uh, Andy's IGA. I'll just go ahead and tell them. And they play this classic rock music every time I go in there. Stuff from when I was, you know, young man and stuff, you know, and way back in, you know, in the last century, you know. Some of you young viewers, you're probably going, wow, I never heard this music. <laughs> it wouldn't even affect you because you haven't heard it. But, you know, I wouldn't understand a lot of your music that you've heard, you know, that you struggle with. But the whole point is uh, they, they play this classic rock stuff. I, I I mean, unless I really, they're the only store that has something or whatever else. And there's a few items that they're the, like the only ones that have it, the right size and the right, you know, whatever. Like they, just tell you, apple cider vinegar. Um, a lot of the stores have the Bragg's apple cider vinegar, but it's just like the little tiny bottle or something. We get the full, the bigger bottle. And like, they're one of the few that has it. Sometimes the other stores will have it, but they have like a really good selection there. And so like the other day it was like, well, we need some apple cider vinegar. Uh, you know, and it's like, well, let's get in and, and get it and then get out of there quick. And so you go in and it's just like you're walking in and going, OK, I don't think I know this song. Grab the stuff and you're walking to the cash register. And just like that, it's like it goes off. The next song comes on and it's some song I'm really familiar with. And it just the vexation. Just like, oh, man, and you're there at the cash register, you know, okay, come on, come on, let's get this thing done. <laughs> I hate that. And, uh, you know, it's just everywhere. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense anymore. You know, I mean, why do they got to play rock and roll music when I'm in the grocery store looking for food? It doesn't make sense. But, uh, so those are nine quick ways that you can tell if somebody's saved or lost. Uh, if they fail those tests, if they have no problem with profanity, if they change the name of Jesus, they're coming along and telling you it's Yeshua and all this other stuff, and they're not Jewish. Number three, they attack the King James Bible. They don't believe in this book. They hate it. Right? Another sign. Number four, they you see tattoos and they're prominently displayed in there and they're sitting in ways that they're they're making sure that you see it. You know, again, I know I know brethren that love the Lord and they had they have tattoos from their past. I'm not gonna judge them. You're not gonna hear me say anything about them. You know. And I know that they feel guilty about it. Again, I've, I've known uh, many different Christians and things, and they're like, you know, brother, I checked into the thing of surgically getting the stuff removed. It's just too expensive. It really doesn't work that well. <sighs> you know, it's, you know, I know it's vexing to them. I thank the Lord I never got a tattoo. Number five, mark of a false convert, mark of, mark of a, a fake professing Christian is, They'll try to get people back to the Torah, to the Old Testament law. Uh, they'll say you have to keep the Sabbath day and all this other stuff. Number six, a false convert will hate Israel. They'll say that they have no right to the land over there, the Jews, 
they aren't really Jews, they're Khazarian something or others, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they hate, you know, they, they shouldn't be given Jerusalem. Israel shouldn't be allowed to have Jerusalem and things like this. You're dealing with somebody who's not saved. Number seven, people that confuse their gender. That's not the mark of a saved Christian. I mean, again, I don't understand why a woman doesn't want to dress, put a dress on. I don't understand that. You know? Number eight, a false convert, a Christian will not, in other words, a Christian will not uh, integrate. Just as simple as that. You're going to have separation, standards of separation, a segregation. That's going to be there. It just comes naturally. Number nine, a Christian will not love the devil's music. It's not going to happen. It's going to vex your soul when you hear the devil's music. So, it's very important that we get this stuff out there because, like I said, uh, we need to purify the church. Uh, we need to start setting our standards higher. And uh, once we do, it's going to be a lot harder for people to infiltrate our numbers and get in and start messing people up. Because somebody comes along and they say, Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, man. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And you look at the list and you go, What do you think about the thing of Jerusalem being the city of Israel and, you know, the thing and whatever else oh man i don't agree with that stinking zionist and stuff you go yeah okay get away from me and down through the list we go over, over each one but you see my point basic just simple things and i'll grant you that there's false false uh, converts out there and things that'll get through some of these tests here but then you'll have to to see them being false in some other area so I just really feel like uh, we really need to start defining some things in the body of Christ. And it's not its not up to me. It's not, you know, Brian Denlinger is the head of the body of Christ or something stupid like that. No, give me a break. But I just know that there's a lot of preachers that are just not willing to take the stands that need to be taken. And so my desire is take the stands, show the scriptures, and prove this stuff and say, okay, now you take those same stands. I thank the Lord. One of the videos that I released... Uh, here, when this one comes out, it'll be a couple days ago. Um, one of the videos I released, I said about the thing of, let me know if there are people, false people in the comments. Excuse me. And um, I've already gotten a couple of you contacted me and just simply said, yeah, um, check out so-and-so. You know, let me know the comments and which video they're making the comments on, the false types of things. I mean, I ban people pretty much every day. You know, I go in there and I check in things like this and, and yep, gone, gone, gone. I mean, I'd probably have a couple more hundred or maybe a thousand or two more subscribers if I wasn't banning people all the time. <laughs> you know, it doesn't bother me at all. But, because uh, I don't make any money with more subscribers, so it doesn't matter. But, uh, just a really important message. The Lord kind of gave me this. And um, I was watching this video the other day, and and uh, and you know, it just kind of prompted this thing. Cause I, I I'm trying to get away with, from any kind of entertainment thing. Occasionally, just doing research for the ministry, and I need to find somebody, you know, talking about this, or I'll look up. I, I, you know, some of you will say, "Did you ever check into such and such subject?" And I'll go, "Okay," and I'll check into it. And I'm watching this video, and this and this guy's a. Christian and he's sitting there and he's got tattooed arms all up and down I thought okay well I'll have some grace maybe that's from the old life and whatever else so I'm like okay and he's got the big long huge beard ironically the guy's name was Brian spelled my way to B-R-Y-A-N and I'm like okay I don't you know maybe he just likes having a really long beard whatever um so I'm watching it and stuff, and pretty soon the guy's bleep, 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 you know, cussing, and I'm like, yeah, okay. Uh, he's failed another test. And then it's, oh, we got to get back to the Torah, and I'm going, okay, if you go back under the Torah there, partner, you kind of have a problem because you're not to print any marks upon you according to the Levitical law. So you're showing off your big tattoos all over your arms. Well, you're not keeping the Torah. So... 
So, you know, you see this type of stuff and it's just, no, sorry, I didn't even get through the whole video. It's just finally like, okay, done, you know. I mean, people write me, hey, brother, could you check this out or could you check that out? Sometimes I do, you know, sometimes I just look at it and I'm like, no, you know. But stand by these tests, okay, these things here for people. Are they swearing? Are they changing the name of Jesus? Do they attack the King James Bible? What is their attitude towards the King James Bible? Do they have tattoos and they're showing things off and fleshly this and that? Are they trying to get people back under the Torah? Do they hate, hate Israel? Uh, are they confusing their gender? Is a man trying to act and look like a woman? A woman trying to act and look like a man? Number eight, do they believe in integration? Number nine, do they love the devil's music? Nine simple things. So that is going to be it. And uh, just uh, want to thank everybody out there for your prayers and for your encouraging comments. And uh, let's hold each other up. Let's hold each other to a higher standard. And uh, please, if you if you if there's something about me that you think is not scriptural or whatever else, you know, give me the scriptures and and whatever, and and say, brother, you're you're doing this and it kind of bothers me or whatever. I you know I, I listen to that stuff. I mean, if I was truly closed-minded, I would just delete any comment that was negative towards me. Look at the comment section. There's a lot of comments that I leave up that are very negative towards me. You know, fine, whatever. So I appreciate you. Even some of my enemies out there, I appreciate you. Um, but just pray for me. All right? Let's pray for each other. And let's hold each other to a higher standard. Thank you for watching.